I don't think that it gets any better, this side of glory, than to talk about the rapture and to have Dr. Fruchtenbaum being the one that's going to instruct us in that. So we are very privileged and blessed to have him with us today. Now the resume of Dr. Fruchtenbaum is, is long and you can find it on the Ariel website. He has an amazing background in life and in education. And on the resource table, there are two biographies. One of these has to do with his family, an incredible story. And he was a, a little child a little, uh, at that time, escaping the Holocaust. And uh, how they really walked across Europe. The other is actually a biography of Arnold himself, and uh, it's a good read. And may I just uh, say to you that it's not easy for a boy of 13 that comes to faith in Christ as a Jew, even dealing with his own family, particularly his father, but other friends and so forth. He hasn't led what I would call an easy life, and he has an amazing story, and that's very special to read, especially those of you that like biographies, and I would encourage you not only for those resources, but for the others that are, that are back there. And in keeping with that, I know that there's a number of folks here that are dealing with lost loved ones and other problems and issues. Uh, this world is a tough place to live, isn't it? We're looking for the next one, amen? amen? Dr. Arnold lost his beloved wife, Mary Ann, back in uh, October. And so he, he shares that same sense of grief and looking forward. I'm sure he, he is looking forward to that rapture as well and to that time of re-meeting uh, re with her. So Dr. Arnold's story of faith is very interesting, and he is the founder and director of Ariel Ministries. And uh, reading from the website, Ariel was created to evangelize and disciple our Jewish brethren, he says. It means Lion of God, and it, representing the Messiah, Yeshua, as the Lion of Judah. It is also an alternate name for Jerusalem, which is found in Isaiah 29.1. It's the city of peace, now waiting for the Prince of Peace to return. It was in Jerusalem in 1966 that a burning seed of desire was planted in the heart of Dr. Arnold so that on December 1st, 1977, here in San Antonio, Ariel Ministries began. The emphasis is on evangelism and discipleship, especially to Jews, the closing words pointing to their purpose reads, In these last days, the necessity and future for Jewish missions has never been greater, and yet we cannot accomplish this work ourselves. We need our brothers and sisters in the Lord, Jew and Gentile alike, to join with and uphold us in this endeavor. And we pray that the Spirit of God will move you to unite with us, he says, in our vision. I remind you again at the close of the service. We have the privilege and opportunity to give uh, to Ariel Ministries and appropriate love and support for what they're doing. Now, Doctor, would you come and teach us again, please? Hopefully everybody has a copy of the outline that we're going to try to cover. Let's begin by turning to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. While you're doing that, I'll tell you a short story from the rabbi of Helm. And the, uh, when the Sabbath begins on Friday evenings at sundown, at the, the Jewish families of the Orthodox gathered together for the purpose of having a short service in the home, and that is partaking of the, of the Shabbat, the Sabbath wine. 
And usually it has a very ornate cup that has been passed down from generation to generation. And the rabbi had this unique cup. He got it from his father, who got it from his father, and so on. And now it was the turn of his firstborn son to receive this family cup. He set the son down and said, son, you will now inherit our Sabbath cup. But I have to warn you about this cup. Only drink from this side, but never drink from this side. The son says, well, I'm honored to have this cup. I know what it means in our family, but I don't understand. What does it matter whether I drink from this side or this side? Rabbi says, listen, I'm a very wise man. You've got to hear me. Only drink from this side of the cup. If you drink from this side of the cup, the wine will spill all over you. <laughs> That'd be one more at the end of the study. <laughs> I want to do three things. First of all, define exactly what the church is biblically, because the rapture will concern only the church saints, not other saints per se. Then secondly, we're going to look at three key passages that describe the rapture event, but doesn't say anything about the timing of that event. And then thirdly, we'll deal with the actual timing of the rapture in connection with the tribulation. So first of all, let's, do, let's give us a definition of the church. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, we read, He is the head of the body, the church. So notice in this verse, the church is the body of the Messiah, and the body of the Messiah is the church. The next question then is, how, what is the composition of the church? And for that, we'll go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, and we'll start with verse 11. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that once ye the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called circumcision, in the flesh made by hands, that you are at that time separate from Messiah, alienated from the commonwealth of, uh, commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope, it would God in the world. Now in Messiah, Jesus, ye that once far off are made nigh in the blood of Messiah, for is our peace who made both one and broke down the middle wall of partition, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, they may create, himself, uh, create in himself of the two one new man, so making peace, and may reconcile them both into one body, unto God through, through the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Paul starts out with the fact that God had two basic ethnic groups, Jews and Gentiles. And the special status of the Jews is that they had a covenant relationship with God. In verse 12, notice the word covenant is in the plural form because God made four eternal and unconditional covenants with the Jewish people. And we call these covenants today the Abrahamic covenant, the land covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. And God's blessings, both material and the spiritual blessings, are mediated by means of these four covenants. He also points out God made another covenant which was different. This one was, the, was the temporary and also conditional, and that is the Mosaic covenant that contained the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law is not merely the Ten Commandments, but the 613 commandments altogether were found in the five book in the the last four books of Moses. And it is, um, and the Gentiles had no relationship with these covenants. And, and while the Mosaic covenant had nine specific purpose, we find in scripture, the one here was to serve as a middle wall of partition to keep Gentiles as Gentiles away from enjoying the spiritual blessings of the Jewish covenants. They could become saved by believing but do not, they never receive the benefits and the blessings of the Jewish covenants. But, um, and so the Gentiles, <coughs> the Gentiles were two things in connection with the covenants. Number one, they were um, strangers to the covenants. They had no right to enjoy these blessings, and they were far off, too far away to enjoy those blessings. So during the reign of the Mosaic law, 
If a Gentile wished to receive these blessings, he would have to undergo full conversion into Mosaic Judaism, undergo circumcision, and take upon himself the obligations of the Torah, the obligations of the law, and live like any Jew would have to live under the Mosaic law. But Gentiles as Gentiles could not enjoy these benefits. When the Messiah died, with that death, he broke down this middle wall of partition. And now Gentiles as Gentile believers can begin to enjoy the spiritual blessings of the Jewish covenants. So in verse 15, he points out of the two entities, he now he creates a third entity, one new man. And this one new man in verse 16 is the body. And we learned from Colossians 1.18 that the body is, um, the, the church is the body of the Messiah. So the church is the body and the composition of the body is all Jews who believe and all Gentiles who believe. But now the question is just how do we enter the body? And for that we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For in or by one spirit were we all baptized into one body, with the Jews or Greeks, with the bond of free, and were all made to drink of one spirit. So the means of entering the body of the Messiah is by means of spirit baptism. And so without the spirit baptism, there is no church, and there is no church without spirit baptism. So we can determine exactly when the spirit baptism begin. It also tell us when the church began. And so we go on now to the next passage, the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. The only gospel that actually mentions the Kehillah, the Ecclesia, the church, happens to be the Gospel of Matthew in two passages. Mark, Luke, and John do not mention the body. But the reason Matthew would is because Matthew is written to a Jewish audience. And within his Gospel, he deals with, in detail with the consequences of Israel's rejection of the Messiah. And one of these consequences was going to be this new entity. And so in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 16, for example, he introduces the body, upon this rock I will build my church, using the future tense. So on replacement theology, they will claim the church began either with Adam or with Abraham. But uh, biblically, the church did not exist anywhere in the history of the Hebrew Bible. And in Matthew 16, it did not exist at that point because he uses the future tense, I will build my church, so it did not exist as yet. Now dealing with Acts chapter 1, look at verse 5. Acts 1 verse 5, For John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be, again the future tense, ye shall be baptized in or by the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Not many days hence when there being a 10-day period from the time he made these statements. And so not only the church not exists during the period of Matthew, it does not exist even at this point of Acts 1.5. It was still in the future. So how can we determine when the, when the spirit baptism began? Because that is when the church began. And uh, the correct answer would be chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And while there is the correct answer, there's one small difficulty in that he does not mention spirit baptism. He mentions in verse 4 being spirit-filled, but being spirit-filled is not the same as being baptized by the spirit into the body. So how can we be certain that spirit baptism did begin in Acts 2 verses 1 through 4? We can determine that by turning to Acts 11. In Acts 10, God sends Peter to the home of uncircumcised Gentiles, the home of Cornelius, and through his preaching ministry to this household of uncircumcised Gentiles, they become believers and they're baptized by the Spirit into the body. Peter stays with them and does something which was prohibited in Jewish circles and early Messianic Jews now recognizing God's new plan and program um, we're still following the pattern. You never sit with uncircumcised Gentiles to partake of food together. 
But Peter did that. So in chapter 11, when he got to Jerusalem, the members of the congregation of Jerusalem attacked him for what he did. And look at 11 verse 2. And when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to men uncircumcised, and you did eat with them, and that was a no-no. So, so to defend his actions of Acts 10, he points out two things. First of all, he told them about the divine revelation God gave him. And how could he be disobedient to the special vision that God gave him back in chapter 10? He was to go to the home of uncircumcised Gentiles and give them the gospel. But the second defense line is what he was the, based upon Acts 1.5. Now skip down to verse uh, four, uh, 14, chapter 11, verse 14. Who shall speak unto these words whereby you shall be saved, and you and all your house? And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, even as on us at the beginning. Let's break the verse down. And I be as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, who are the them, the uncircumcised Gentiles of chapter 10 even as on us, who are the us, the members of the Jewish congregation in Jerusalem. And then at the beginning, and when did the Spirit first fall upon the Jewish people in Jerusalem? That's Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, within the context of the same book. And so he then adds in verse 16, And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized in or by the Holy Spirit. So we read from verse 16 that when the Spirit first fell upon the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, that was when Spirit, Holy, that's when Spirit baptism began, and that's when the church began. Let's summarize. The church is the body of the Messiah. It's comprised of both Jewish and Gentile believers who entered the body by means of spirit baptism. And as of Acts 1, 5, spirit baptism had not yet begun, and therefore the church was not yet born. And according to this context, the spirit first fell upon the Jewish believers in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. That's when they were baptized into the body, and that's when the church began. And that is uh, the element that we need to know exactly who's involved in the rapture. Now we're going to turn to the three key passages on the rapture event. And let's turn, first of all, to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. It involves the discussions that are taking place during the, what is called the Last Supper, but it would be more, more correctly to be called the Last Passover. And discussions, he makes an announcement to his apostles in chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I come again and will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He tells them he will soon be leaving them for a lengthy period of time. And he's going to go back to where he came from. He came from heaven, which means he will now return to heaven. No, he's not going to go back to Utah. He's going back to heaven. And while he's in heaven, he'll be building a, a place for them. And once that place is finally complete, then he will come for them to take them to where he was then going. So what he promises here is a, a special coming just for believers, for the purpose of taking them to heaven. And that is a clear teaching on the rapture events which will only be affecting members of the body of the Messiah and the apostles are part of the foundation of the church. So here we have a clear statement of a special coming for believers only for the purpose of taking them to heaven. But it says nothing about the timing of this event at this stage. Let's go to the passage that was read, which is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thess 
chapter 4. In verse 13, he introduces this topic by saying, I would not have you ignorant concerning those that have fallen asleep, meaning those who have died. And normally his pattern in church planting, he would go into a city like Corinth. He would begin with the Jewish evangelism at the synagogue and will continue that ministry until he was expelled from the synagogue. He then would also go out to the Gentiles and from the Jews and Gentiles who believed, he organized them into a local congregation, a local church. He will stay with them to teach them the whole counsel of God. At the same time, he would, he would also teach them uh, and train certain people into the positions of elders and deacons. And then he would move on to a new locality and begin the process all over again. He was unable to complete the process in the city of Thessalonica because persecution broke out rather early in that city, and he had to flee the city, and so many questions about things he had begun to teach but could not complete teaching were unanswered. And so one of these questions, which the Thessalonian church now raised by means of a letter to the apostle, um, and the question rises, it's obvious from the question he taught them certain things about the rapture, but the question that was not yet answered is this, if a believer dies before the rapture, will he miss out on the benefits of the rapture? This was not merely a curio just a curiosity question. Some believers died because of the persecution. And because they died, the rapture had not yet occurred, will they miss out on the benefit of the rapture? So in verse 13, he wants them to know he does not want them to continue in this ignorance about the position of dead believers in reference to the rapture. And he spells out in verse 14 what we have to believe, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also that have fallen asleep in Jesus um, shall God bring with him. So the emphasis here, they don't need to be worried about living about dead saints missing out on the benefits of the rapture. Because as uh, he will point out, before living believers receive the benefits of the rapture, the dead believers will receive the benefits first. She doesn't want them to be ignorant about the position of dead saints. They will be risen again. As then in verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the, word of the Lord, that we who are alive the left unto the coming of the Lord shall in no wise precede them that have fallen asleep. So he spells out to give them comfort that before living believers are affected by the rapture, dead believers will be affected first. Their resurrection will come, come first and then will come um, the catching up of the living saints. What he goes on to do then in verses 16 and 17 is to point out that the rapture will occur in seven specific stages. These stages will come very quickly in the twinkling of an eye in the next passage we'll look at. But they will come in specific stages, one after the other. So stage number one, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. At some point he will rise up from where he now sits at the right hand of God the Father and he'll return to this earth's atmosphere. Second statement, with a shout. The Greek word for shout deals with a command that a military officer would give. So in the ancient format, when the military commander came out of his commander's tent, he would issue a specific order for something to occur. And by the same token, when he descends from heaven, enters the atmosphere, he'll give a shout for the process of the rapture event to take place. Stage number three, with the voice of the archangel. There is only one archangel, his name is Michael. And keeping with the, with the military motif, when the chief commander gave his order, the commander would then be, the command would then be repeated by the sub-commander. And so the archangel Michael, the sub-commander, is going to be repeating the order of the chief commander. Then will come stage number four with the trumpet of God, and this continues the same military motif. That once the 
uh, sub commander repeats the order of the chief commander, then the, then we'll deal with the issue that will follow. And the, uh, only after the um, trumpet sounds, someone we'll say more about the trumpet in our next passage, that the, um, the result will be in the fifth stage, the dead in Messiah shall rise first. So based upon the trumpet call, the soldiers would know how to respond by the same token when the trumpet is sounded after the repetition of the command by the archangel. Then at that moment, the dead in the Messiah shall rise first. Notice the phrase in Messiah in Christ. Paul uses certain phrase in a very technical manner such as in Jesus, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ, in him, in whom, in the Lord. These are all technical terms applied to those believers who became believers and then were baptized into the body of the Messiah. And so they are in Messiah. And so at that point, not all saints are resurrected, but church saints will be resurrected from the dead. The sixth stage, then we that are alive the left shall together with them be caught up in the cloud. Notice how Paul identifies himself. He doesn't identify himself with the dead to be resurrected. He feels he could still be living when the rapture occurs. So he says, we, that includes him. Do we that alive, the left shall also be caught up. And that's what the word means, to be caught up. And so he identifies himself with the living saints because this still could have happened in his lifetime. It was an imminent event. It doesn't turn out that it went that way, but it could have come that way. And so only then are the living believers caught up in the clouds. Now in our day, the rapt in some circles, the rapture doctrine itself is under heavy attack. And in other circles, or larger circles, the pre-rapture, pre pre-tribulation rapture is under heavy attack. And um, I run into the uh, people who don't believe in any rapture, and one of the things they say to me is, the word rapture is not found anywhere in the Bible. And that's true. It's not found in any English Bible I know of. Now, these are members of, of um, long-time denominational churches. So I respond by asking them, by the way, do you believe in the Trinity? The millions, of course we do. But why do they believe in the Trinity? That word is not found anywhere in the Bible either. Because the issue is not if, what, uh, if a specific term is found in an English Bible. The issue is what do we mean by that term? Is what we mean by it found in Scripture? So what do we mean by Trinity? That we believe in only one God, but there are three personalities in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Bible calls the Father, God, the Son, God and the Spirit of God it doesn't teach three gods. It teaches only one God. And so it use this word trinity or triunity to emphasize that of this one, uh, one, one um, God that exists in three personalities. And, while the, and uh, the word trinity is not found either in Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek. But the Hebrew word for, uh, Greek word for rapture does appear in the New Testament, the Greek word here in verse 16 uh, is harpazo, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O, and it means either to be raptured or to be caught up. That's the meaning of the term. And the ones that are going to be suddenly caught up are those who are the living in the sixth stage. So first of all, the dead in Messiah are resurrected, and we who are believing at that time will be caught up, harpazo. We can go ahead and remove the word rapture, and from now on only use the phrase catching up. By saying the catching up, we have not changed the doctrine of what the rapture is about. We we'll simply use the, a different definition to focus more on the meaning of the Greek word. Uh, the word rapture is based upon a Latin term, in the Latin vulgate, but the Greek term harpazo simply means to be caught up. In the sixth stage, we're caught up in the clouds, and we're caught up only after the dead saints have been resurrected. And then will come the seventh stage, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall more be with the Lord. So resurrected dead saints and caught up living saints will gather together and meet them in the air. 
And when we meet in the air, where do we go? In post-tribulationism, they claim we make a U-turn and come back to the earth. That does not fulfill the promise of, of John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. We meet him in the air. But then he takes us into heaven to take us to where he was then going. And so, the, uh, and, and so on. So that is the purpose of the rapture, to take us into heaven where he was then going. The passage here says nothing about the timing of this event, only emphasizes the issue of what happens with death saints, which concern the church at the time that the rapture occurs. Now the third passage is 1 Corinthians 15. The context is verses 50 through 58. Verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. And the point is that the kind of bodies in which we now live, dead bodies suffer corruption, living bodies suffer mortality, because we're all gonna die unless the rapture comes in our lifetime. And these are not the kind of bodies with which we can enter into heaven, into the eternal kingdom, and so on. So at some point, there needs to be a change in the nature of the bodies which now we live in, which now exists. So verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. It's important to understand what the term mystery means in a New Testament sense. In our English language today, the term mystery applies to something we don't have an answer for something we don't understand as yet, like the TV show, Unsolved Mysteries. But that's not the meaning of the Greek word. The Greek word emphasizes a biblical truth that was never revealed anywhere in the Hebrew Bible, being revealed for the first time by the New Testament. Now, how do we derive that um, definition? Keep your finger here. We'll come back to it momentarily and turn momentarily to Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter 3. And look at verse 3. Ephesians 3, 3. How thou by revelation was made known unto me, meaning Paul, the mystery, as I wrote before you in few words. Here's the first use of the term in this context the mystery which was revealed uniquely to the apostle. Verse 4, whereby ye can read and perceive my understanding in the mystery of the Messiah. Again, notice the word. And he finally tells us what he means by it in verse 5, which in other generations was not made known unto sons of men, as has not been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. The term mystery then, as defined here, is something totally unrevealed anywhere in the pages of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, only being revealed in the pages of the New Testament. And I might point out altogether there are eight divine mysteries and two satanic ones. There's a study of all eight mysteries. If you have the Footsteps of the Messiah book, it's, in the, it's one of the appendices. But uh, it was, but, and um, one of these mysteries was he's defining in this situation here. So it's a mystery is something totally unrevealed, only now being revealed by whom? The New Testament apostles and New Testament prophets. Let's skip down to verse uh, 9. Verse 9, to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery. This is the term again, which for ages has been hid in God who created all things. Well, has been hidden for ages. It is now being revealed again by New Testament apostles and prophets. Now go to Colossians chapter 1. And look at verse 25, Colossians 1 verse 25. Whereof I was made the minister, according to the dispensation of God, which was given me to you, word, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, 
notice the term, which had been hid for ages and generations, but now has it been manifested to his saints, to whom God was pleased to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, again the term, among the Gentiles, which is Messiah in you, the hope of glory. So again, the term mystery means something that was totally unrevealed in the pages of the Hebrew Bible, only not being revealed in the pages of the New Testament. Now go back to 1 Corinthians 15. So going back to verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. And one of these mysteries has to do with the rapture of the church, which is what's going to be the context of this. And keep in mind that the, that the second coming would never be able to be a mystery. We have a lot more details about the second coming of the Messiah from the Hebrew Bible than we have anywhere else, even more than what's found in the New Testament. But the church was nowhere mentioned in the New Testament, and even less so, the rapture event. And that's why it's going to be defined as a mystery. And he repeat three of those seven steps we saw in the Thessalonian epistle. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we all shall not sleep, meaning we shall not, we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed. Every, everybody undergoes a change. Mortality, he'll tell us, puts on immortality. Corruption puts on incorruption. And the quickness of it is in verse 52, in a moment. The Greek word used here is the source of English word, the uh, English word atom, in the atom of time, very quickly. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and then notice three specific events we already know from the Thessalonian epistle. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. Excuse me, before that, the trump, for, uh, at, the la, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality, and when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying, uh, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? And so on to the end of the passage. So what he points out, that there's going to be certain steps in the rapture event. He mentions three of these steps. Altogether, we know there are seven. And at that point, for the dead body, whose body has suffered corruption, corruption puts on incorruption. For the living body, in mortal bodies, mortality puts on immortality. But go back to verse 51 for a moment. Behold, I tell you mystery, we all shall not sleep, but we all shall be changed. Notice, as in the Thessalonian epistle, Paul does not connect himself with the dead to be resurrected. He connects himself with the living, whose body will undergo a change from mortal to immortality. So he anticipated that possibility this rapture event could happen in his lifetime. Now, the passage as such doesn't say anything about the timing of the event, but what it does emphasize is it will happen very quickly and very suddenly. Now, those who happen to be post-tribulational like to claim that this, the last trump has to be the seventh trumpet of Revelation, and therefore the rapture has to be post-tribulational. Now, there's a, quite, there's a problem with that objection because at the time that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, there was no knowledge of any seven trumpets found in Revelation. The book of Revelation was written somewhere around 95 AD. By then, he was the last of the apostles still living. So the Corinthian church could not have known anything about the seven trumpets of Revelation, which they connect with the rapture. In fact, both mid-trips, three-quarter trips, and post-trips all use the same argument. They just disagree among themselves as to the timing of the blowing of the seventh trumpet. When the Corinthians got this letter and read this passage, here's what they could not do. They could not raise the question, what in the world does Paul mean by the last trump? Pull out the book of Revelation, turn to chapter 11, and says, well, this must be it. There was no book of Revelation yet. Not, that source was not yet revealed as yet. 
So what does he mean by the last trump? It all falls back on the seven feasts of Israel of Leviticus chapter 23, where he points out the program of Messiah, certain things relevant to his first coming, certain things relevant to his future comings. And so in Leviticus 23, the first, pa the first feast is the feast of Passover fulfilled by Messiah's death. Then secondly, the feast of unleavened bread fulfilled by the offering of his sonless blood. Thirdly, the feast of first fruits fulfilled by the resurrection of the Messiah. And then the feast of weeks of Pentecost fulfilled by the birthday of the church. So the first four feasts have been fulfilled, but there are three more feasts to be, uh, to be uh, fulfilled. And that was the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. The Day of Atonement will be fulfilled by the uh, Tribulation, and this was National Atonement in the Tribulation. And the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, will be fulfilled by the Messianic Kingdom, but preceding both of those is the Feast of Trumpets. So what does the last trump refer to? He obviously expects the Corinthians to know what he's talking about. He spent three and a half years in Corinth. He attempted to teach them the whole counsel of God. When you go to any synagogue service, you will, you will hear the sound of the shofar, which refers to the ram's horn. There's a different word for trumpet, but in Hebrew there's a special word for the shofar, which is, you, which is the ram's horn. And it is blown in the synagogue service on the Feast of Trumpets. There will be a total of 100 trumpet sounds. The first 99 are of three different lengths. Some are short, some are long, some are staccato. They go back and forth, back and forth for 99 blows. When you get to the 100 uh, uh, blowing of the trumpet, it's called the last trump. It's also called the longest trump. It's as long as the blower can hold his breath. And this is the last trump. And in Judaism, it symbolizes the resurrection of Israel to bring them into the Messianic kingdom, connected with the resurrection of the dead. And Paul does pick up the motif of the resurrection of the dead, but he applies it more specifically to church saints, involving both Jews and Gentile believers. And so the last trump has nothing to do with the seven trumpet, the revelation, which won't be revealed for about 30 more years. But it does uh, refer specifically to the fulfillment of the seven feasts of Israel. Now go back to chapter 5 of this book, where you notice how often he refers back to one of these festivals. In chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, the Feast of uh, Passover. In verse 8, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In verses 11 through, um, just say, first contains 11 through 14, it deals with the uh, church. And then if you look at chapter 15, verses 20 through 23, the feast of, uh, is connect, he connects this with the resurrection of the Messiah. And so what he does in 1 Corinthians 15, 15 verses 50 to 58, makes one more connection. And the one more connection is with the um, blowing of the trumpet fulfill, is going to be fulfilled by the resurrection of the church, which happens at the rapture. And so at this point, the passage says nothing about the timing of the event. If it indicates anything, it would imply a pre-tribulational rapture, because just as trumpets comes before the feast of the, uh, not the feast, but the Day of Atonement, by the same token, it would mean that the um, rapture has to occur sometime before the tribulation starts. So if it implies anything about timing, it doesn't really say much about timing. If it implies anything about it, it would be something in the area of the pre-tribulational rapture. So these are three key passages. Now let's deal with the actual timing of the rapture. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Let me begin with a very simple observation, and that's this. In no tribulation passage is the church ever mentioned. It would not be mentioned in the Old Testament, though there are many tribulation passages, because the church was a mystery. It would not be even found understood in the Old Testament. 
But in the New Testament passages, like in Matthew, Luke, and Mark, and also in Revelation, the church is never found in any single tribulation passage. And nobody who is mid-trip or three-quarter trip or post-trip can never take you to a passage that mentions the church being there. It does not exist in any tribulation passage. People are forced, this people who hold to replacement theology of some kind, of kind of forced to be either mid-trip, post-trip, or three-quarter trip. Be that's because of the presupposition that the, ch the, the church is the new Israel. But uh, the word Israel, by the way, is mentioned exactly 73 times in the New Testament. Not once is it used of the church. They make the assumption, but it's never clearly seen anywhere in any passage. Now, Luke 21 has been dealing with some of the events of the tribulation. Now, look at verse 36. Well, let's begin at verse 35. Chapter 21, verse 35. For so shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of all the earth. Notice the word all used twice. It makes it all inclusive. It will fall upon all of them that live anywhere on the earth. It will fall on all them that may be as being anywhere on the earth. So keep in mind, the tribulation judgments will affect everyone living on the earth. So there's no way of escaping the tribulation judgments if you're in the earth. And now look at verse 36, but watch him every season making supplication that she may prevail to escape all these things. What things? All the tribulation verses in the preceding segment. He may be able to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And to stand before him, the Lord before the Son of Man is a judgmental phrase, but it refers to the church saints that will stand before the judgment seat of the Messiah to be evaluated how we serve the Lord since we believed. But the, So being on the earth, notice he clearly says, no one escapes. Not that everybody will die, but nobody escapes the judgments that will fall upon them. But uh, there is a way of escaping it, and the way of escaping it is to stand before the Son of Man, and to stand before the Son of Man means you have to be taken to heaven, which is what the rapture will do, and fulfillment of the promise of John 14, verses 1 through 3. So this is the earlier statement by way of timing, that the, this is going to be an occasion where they will stand before the Son of Man, and therefore they'll escape all of the tribulation judgments. Let's go on to First um, Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thess chapter 1. Verse 9, For they themselves report concerning us what manner of entering we had unto you, and how ye turned unto God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom ye raised from the dead, even Jesus, even Yeshua, who delivers us from what? The wrath to come. When the Bible talks about the wrath of God, it talks about the wrath of God in two different senses. The first way in dealing with the wrath of God is the God's present wrath against sin. What's mentioned in Romans chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and the righteousness of men. And believers are delivered from that kind of wrath of God. But, first, but secondly, there is a future wrath, the wrath of the tribulation. And verse 10 talks about the wrath to come, the future, tribulate, the future wrath of the tribulation. And again, in keeping with John 14, verses 1 through 3, a special coming of the Messiah for the purpose of delivering them from the wrath to come. And so here's again a clear promise that we shall not be here on earth during that period of time of the wrath to come. Now let's go to chapter 5 of the same book. Now keep in mind he talked about the, the rapture in chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We covered that earlier this hour. 
But now look in the chapter 5, verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that ought be written unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And when they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall in no wise escape. He now introduces a new topic, as we mentioned last night. He uses two Greek words, peri, P-E-R-I, P-E-R-I, and the word de, D-E, de, D-E. The most common use of that term in his writings is in 1 Corinthians. He goes from one topic to another topic to another topic in the 16 chapters. Every time he introduces a new topic, in Greek it says peri de, in English concerning, um, concerning the, this or concerning that or but concerning, and so on. So every time you see in 1 Corinthians, but concerning, you notice he's introducing a brand new topic. And that's what's happening here. He discussed the topic of the rapture at the end of chapter 4, but in chapter 5, verse 1, but concerning is the new topic. New topic is the day of the Lord. And the point of chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, the church is not appointed to the wrath of the tribulation. So in chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 3, the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. He discussed the rapture in the preceding section of chapter 4. He begins with verse 1, peri der, a new topic is introduced, which is the tribulation. And so while people are saying peace and safety, thinking the wars have ended, it suddenly hits not, uh, not the believer, but the unbeliever. So in verses 4 through 8, he says the day will not overtake the believer as a thief. And he falls back on how the day of the Lord is described in the book of Zephaniah 1, verses 14 through 20. Zephaniah 1, verses 14 through 20. Also to some degree in Acts 1, or Acts 2, rather, verses 1 through 11. And he describes the day of the Lord based upon the Zephaniah prophecy. The day of the Lord... Is a, is, a, is a time that is false upon the sons of darkness and the sons of the night. And so it will overtake them unexpectedly because they are sons of darkness and sons of the night. But the leavers are of the day and of the light, so not, it will not come upon them suddenly. And why? Because in verse 9, believers are not appointed unto wrath. And what's the antecedent to wrath in this context? And that is in verses 1, 2, and 3, the day of the Lord. Believers have not been appointed to suffer the day of the Lord. They're not appointed to that wrath. And the wrath goes back to verse 2. And the means of escaping the wrath is what? The rapture event which he described in the preceding context, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Let's now move to Revelation. Let's look at chapter 3. Now, he uses the term ecclesia, the church, heavily in the first three chapters. So he's not, a, he's not ashamed of using that term. But once you get to the end of chapter 3, the church is not mentioned anywhere on the earth. So looking at chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10, because you did keep the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, that hour which is to come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And so he gives complimentary of this church. It's a believing church. It's a word that means the church of brotherly love, so it cannot be the church of Pennsylvania, cannot Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's the city of brotherly shove. 
but the believers are of the brotherly love. And this is a believing church, so he gives them the promise, they shall be taken away. They will not suffer the time of the trial to come upon the whole earth to try them to fall upon the earth. Chapters 5 and 6 will mention saints in heaven, and this would include the church saints now raptured in heaven. But when he gets into the tribulation from chapter 6 to chapter 18, that's most of the book. From chapter 6 to chapter 18, you will not find the church mentioned even one time. No church mentioned in the first half of the tribulation, no church mentioned up to the three-quarter point, no church mentioned to the end of the tribulation. It does not exist. And no one who claims to be a pre-trip, uh, uh, let's just say, um, no one who claims to be post-trip or three-quarter trip will never be able to take you to any verse in a tribulation context, and this is a big context in the tribulation, not be able to take you to any passage that mentions the church because it is not there. The church will come up only after the tribulation judgments in chapter 18. What they usually claim is God will keep the church saints safe in the tribulation, but if that's what they believe, something goes terribly haywire. Because in chapter saints, saints are getting killed. Chapter 7, saints are getting killed. Chapter 11, saints are getting killed. Chapter 12, saints are getting killed. Chapter 13, saints are getting killed. Chapter 14, saints are getting killed. Chapter 17, saints are getting killed. Chapter 18, saints are getting killed. So God is promising church saints in the tribulation. He's doing a terrible job of it. Saints are getting massacred all over the tribulation. So how does, how does this relate to chapter 3, verse 10? Chapter 3, verse 10 is a promise to church saints. Those who choose to believe only after the rapture don't have the same promise, and they suffer heavy persecution throughout the tribulation. And so there is no mention of the church. Now go over to chapter 19. In chap now, chapter 19, the second coming is begun, begins to be detailed in verse 11. However, in the first 10 verses, he describes events in heaven before the second coming, one of which is the wedding ceremony of the church. Now, let's look at verse 6 of chapter 19. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be exceeding glad. Let us give the glory unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife had made herself ready. It was given unto her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. In the Jewish wedding system, there are four specific stages. The first stage is the arrangement which is made between the father of the groom and the father of the bride, and the bride, the bride price is paid. And then there's usually at least one year wait. Sometimes it's longer because sometimes the arrangement is, weighed or is made when the future bride and groom are merely children, not yet re ready for any wedding. But once that the arrangement is made, then the um, uh, is sealed, and then there'll be at least one year wait and sometimes more. And the first, uh, the passage that deals with the first stage is in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through the end of the passage. And that's where we learn that the church is the bride of the Messiah, and the bride price has been paid, and God the Father paid the price, the price of the bride, which, for the bride, which is the blood of his son. So the first stage has already been arranged, and God the Father paid the price, and that was the blood of his son. The second stage is called the fetching of the bride. And at some point, the groom will go to the home of the bride to fetch her to his home, and that is what the rapture will be. 
But the two elements here we should notice. First of all, it is not the groom that determines the timing of the fetching of the bride. That's determined by the father of the groom. So not being Messiah the Son that will determine the timing of the fetching of the bride, God the Father will determine that timing. So in his humanity, in his deity he was omniscient, but his humanity did not know when this would come. And the second element is, and is that the father will not send the groom to fetch the bride until the groom has added something in the family compound they could bring the bride into that becomes the private chamber between the bride and the groom. And that is what the promise he was making, as we read earlier in John 14, verses 1 through 3. He's going to go back to heaven, and while he's in heaven, he'll be preparing a place for all of us. And once the place is prepared, then the father of the groom will send the son to fetch the bride, and that will be the second stage. The third stage is the wedding ceremony, which is what we see here. And notice that at the time of the wedding ceremony, the bride is dressed in fine linen, which he interprets for us is the righteous acts of the saints. So it means that the bride didn't just now arrive. When she arrived into heaven at the time of the rapture, she had to undergo the judgment seat of the Messiah detailed in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. And all the wood hay stubble has been burned away to nothing but the ashes. All the gold, silver, precious stone has been purified. So all that's now showing on the bride is the righteous acts of the bride. That's all that is showing. And that will fulfill the third stage, the wedding ceremony. It will happen in heaven before the second coming. And then comes the fourth stage, which is the wedding feast, which will last normally in ancient times for seven days. And now look at verse 9. And he sent to them, write, Blessed are they that are bidden to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Only after the wedding ceremony is the message sent out to those who are bidden. And that, will, and that will be the wedding feast. It will happen after the second coming. It will inaugurate the Messianic kingdom. And the first seven days of the Messianic kingdom, at least, will be the wedding feast of the Lamb. And among those who are going to be attending it will include the resurrected Old Testament saints and the resurrected tribulation saints. But, but all of this, the bride is already in heaven and has been there for a while because every individual has to stand before their judgment seat. has been there for a while, before the wedding ceremony takes place and before the wedding feast takes place. And that is where we who are now believers are going to be participant in. And, that, and, our, and our blessed hope is not looking for who the next president is. It's not the hope of um, hoping for, for, to see the Antichrist. We may never see him per se. But the um, blessed hope is the return of the Messiah for the purpose of taking us to heaven in the promise he made in John 14, verses 1 through 3. We'll take a few minutes for some questions momentarily. I think of about 10 minutes. Let me just give you one more rabbi story from Helm in Poland. In Europe, all over, including Poland, there was a synagogue building. Attached to the synagogue building was the yeshiva building, which is the school that the Jewish boys would go into. And it was getting crowded in the school, and so they needed to expand their building, so the rabbi hired several workers from Helm to do the job. And to see how they were doing, they were going out to see. And he noticed once one uh, person doing some uh, doing strange things. He would pull out a nail and look at it and hammer in. He pulls out a second nail and looks at it and throws it away. So some nails he hammered in like he was supposed to, but some nails he threw away. Rabbi asked the man, why are you throwing these good nails away? And he says, well, when I pull out the nail and look at it, they sometimes put the head of the nail at the wrong end, and I can't hammer in that way. The rabbi says, no, no, you don't understand. These are for the other side of the building. <laughs> okay, we'll take uh, 10 minutes, if that's all right. 